a moment where you had what you said was a pre-revolutionary situation in 77 and then a year later the mullahs appeared on the scene and yes it's true that there are all these discussions taking place but something else happened as well and that was at the two day the communist party you know, actively set out to make an alliance with the ayatollahs and you know, they paid a very heavy price for that you know their entire organization was executed but you know, there was a choice there that could have been made and the voices that were saying you know this is a wrong choice were much too marginal much too isolated to cut off you know, from the industrial workers because there was a big strike wave happening as well and you know with a different strategic orientation the outcome could have, outcome could have been completely different I've got a rhetorical question you know in view of the fact that a planned war against Iran is part of an imperialist strategy for the region and there's an existence uh, an anti-war movement in Britain and Ireland and across Europe why not integrate what you're doing into that campaign instead of setting up an additional organization just a little comment as to if there's this collaboration between the Iranian ruling elite and the United States uh, or Western imperialist ruling elites how does his Buddha figure in this, especially since it has its deep roots in the Shia Muslim communities of Lebanon. How will it take being used, assuming they are being used, and then dumped by the Iranian foreign policy should it suit the Tehran elites, etc.? The role of the left in the Iranian revolution, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, in February 1979, when the insurrection took place, uh, we had had four months of general strike before this. There were strike committees in more or less every Iranian you know, factory. Uh, there were strike committees in banks and institutions of even the governmental, you know, the bureaucracy. Uh, you had neighborhood committees everywhere uh, because of the a shortage of uh, food, uh, fuel, etc. Neighborhood committees have sprung up everywhere in every major city, which were basically running the neighborhood. Uh, the left, as an organization, was very weak because a whole section of the left went towards this uh, so-called armed struggle, guerrilla warfare, and uh, I mean this may be an exaggeration, but. Uh, on the night of the insurrection, honestly, if you had an organization with a thousand cadres and they knew what they are doing, you could have taken power in Tehran because it was such a chaos. Uh, Khomeini's forces were on the street saying, "Go back home, go back home." Imam has not ordered an insurrection, you know, uh, it, because they had made a deal above Miss U.S. Imperials directly for a change of government. Uh, as I said, the Royal Guard revolted against this deal, came to suppress the Air Force barracks, which were uh, anti-Shah technicians. This was the technicians, uh, the people who are repairing the planes and the helicopters, etc. So the sort of technicians, the repair barracks of the Air Force. And they, because they were supporting the opposition to the Shah. They came to suppress this. This led to an insurrection. So the insurrection was not planned. Was uh, out of their control. Uh, but at, at the night of the insurrection in Tehran, the left was hardly there. I mean, they didn't exist. We were, the, I mean, we were one of the smallest groups. We were sort of, you can imagine, Trotsky's, Iranian Trotsky's group, how large that can be. You know, in 19, you know, 79, we are talking about. Yeah? So, we were not a major group of any significance. Uh, but we were the first to publish a paper. The two the party because they didn't know what to say. Basically they didn't want to say anything. They rather keep quiet and leave the Khomeini's leadership, you know, uh, to handle the politics basically. But even after the insurrection, uh, for at least a year and a half, uh, the Islamic regime was not really strong. Was, had not really consolidated power. Uh, for example, the military campaign in Kurdistan got defeated. That's why they occupied the U.S. Embassy. 
the incident of the U.S. Embassy occupation came after the first military defeat in Kurdistan. In order to turn that around, they went and occupied the U.S. Embassy and took U.S. Embassy workers as hostages and brought out this anti-imperial thing to divert attention from this defeat in Kurdistan. <coughs> A year after the <coughs> insurrection, the first election for parliament in which the left was allowed to participate. There were limitations, candidates were, you know, arrested, etc. But nevertheless, there was a limited uh, freedom to participate. The combined force of the left got one and a half million votes. So the left wasn't weak numerically. And even after the insurrection, a year and a half after the insurrection, uh, things were actually looking up. The regime was beginning to weaken and the left was beginning to take shape. But unfortunately, vast sections of the left basically went behind Khomeini. At the leadership in Iran, you had three major left groups. The pro-Soviet Union Iranian version of Communist Party called the Tuda Party, the Mass Party, uh, which was formed in 1941. Then you had the Maoist groups, which had originally split from the pro-Soviet uh, to the party and formed in 1966 when the Sino-Soviet split took place. In Iran, we had the same split. And had, then they had a split further, so we had two or three major Maoist groups, which were actually much larger than the Tudor party. Then you had the Fedai groups, the guerrilla groups, the armed struggle groups, which despite the fact that they denounced the Tudor party, but this denunciation was simply over forms of a struggle, not over program or strategy. Uh, if you read the Fedai's literature of the period, it's more or less the same rubbish as the Stalinist you know, writing, but they just add an you know, armed struggle at the end of it. Otherwise, the same you know, revolution by stages, national bourgeoisies are allied, Petty bourgeoisie is a revolutionary anti-imperialist force. You know, the usual jargon that you see in this class collaboration is politics of the uh, pro-Soviet or pro-Chinese groups. You could see in the Fedais. And precisely a year and a half after the, after the U.S. Embassy occupation, Fedais split. The majority went to the Tudor party. Uh, and that was the largest section of the left, the Fedais. Uh, they were by far the largest group inside the Iranian left. Because after the insurrection, a lot of people who became now left joined Fedai, gathered around Fedai, because they knew Fedai used to struggle against the Shah. And to the party, didn't fight the Shah. So the choice was obvious. They went for Fedai. Uh, but Fedai, when they turned towards Khomeini, the majority of them, broke the back of the left, basically. So you are exactly right. In fact, uh, part of the responsibility for the uh, victory of Khomeini's leadership is the Iranian left, in particular the Tudor party. And of course, the Tudor party had its own reasons. The Tudor party, basically, what they wanted to do is destroy the deal that has been made uh, with USA and Khomeini's leadership. Uh, so they sort of uh, provoked a faction within the Islamic leadership uh, to uh, overthrow the faction which was pro-American and sort of take an anti-American, you know, strengthen the anti-American faction. Uh, the U.S. Embassy occupation was a key uh, event in this, you know, maneuver organized uh, by the two party, and they succeeded in doing that. But when they succeeded in doing that, as you said, then you know, the whole leadership, when the task was finished, then the whole leadership was arrested, executed, and it's now, as a political force, completely finished. Uh, on the question of why not join other anti-war movement, well, uh, as you can appreciate, it's uh, very specific our issue. So we had to organize a separate, but we are obviously not against coalition or cooperation or joint activities with other anti-war movement. Uh, 
uh, we even tried to join the anti-war coalition in uh, UK and you know SWP and British CP both uh, collaborated with uh, Iranian regime's lobby in England, Kazmi campaign against sanctions and military intervention in Iran, which is uh, directly funded by Iranian regime. I know the guys who are running it. Uh, uh, the actual leader of it, Abbas Edalat, I know. I challenged him publicly. You are an Iranian agent. If you dare, uh, you know, come and challenge me in courts. I prove it. You know, he has never, you know, taken up the challenge. He's, you know, an uh, Iranian agent. You know, uh, this is what is happening in this anti-war coalition movement in Britain. Unfortunately, it's dominated now by the coalition of Iranian regime. Respect was there, respect is now out. Iranian regime, SWP, British CP. So, how, I mean, even though we said we want to join, we want to be part of this uh, bigger anti war coalition movement, uh, you know, they voted to, uh, you know, throw us out of anti war coalition because we are criticizing the Iranian regime. Uh, so, they have made it impossible for us at the moment because the left in the UK is dominated at the moment, unfortunately, by these two groups. Uh, but we are not against it. We are all for collaboration, cooperation, joint activities, even a coalition of some sort. And I hope that happens. We are developing some good links with the uh, sort of Palestinian and uh, Turkish and Afghani sort of refugees in the UK. Hopefully something would come out of that in the future. On the Hezbollah in Lebanon, you know, Hezbollah in Lebanon, although, bear in mind, Hezbollah in Lebanon is not like Iranian regime. It, as you said, it has a mass base, it represents uh, some of the poorest sections of the Lebanese society. But don't forget, Hezbollah itself came into being after the Iranian regime. Before it was Amal movement, if you remember the Shia movement, which was, was Amal movement. In fact, a lot of leaders of the Iranian regime were before the uh, Iranian revolution in Lebanon, in Amal camps in uh, Lebanon. They were trained. The first uh, commander of the Iranian army was actually a guerrilla in Lebanon in the Amal movement. You know. So they had very close links. Uh, between the Iranian leadership and the uh, Shia movement in Lebanon. They s set up Hezbollah as in opposition to Amal, actually. This direct intervention of the Iranian regime. And the first year, you may not believe this, they were financing it to the tune of one billion dollars a year. The Hezbollah movement in Lebanon was being financed directly by the Iranian government to the tune of one billion dollars a year. A set of supermarkets, hospitals, you know, all these charity foundations, and basically in the course of five or six years, they totally destroyed Amal, and they have not taken over completely the Shia leadership. So, leaving aside the mass base of that movement, the leadership is as reactionary as the Iranian regime and direct agents of the Iranian regime. Without the Iranian regime, they would be finished in one week. You know, so uh, don't fall, I, I know you are not, didn't suggest that, but I'm saying we should not fall for the trap of saying, oh, they represent the poor people against Zionism. No, their leadership is as reactionary and fascistic as the Iranian regime. Uh, and as soon as the Iranian regime, you know, its politics in the Middle East uh, are sorted out, uh, I bet you it would pull the rug from under them. Uh, as it has done many times. At the moment it cannot because it has uh, different uh, conflicts of interest which goes back uh, many years in history. So you cannot just uh, disentangle from that so quickly. Uh, but don't think for a moment that because Hezbollah in Lebanon has a mass base is somehow a different movement. Uh, because uh, the Islamic regime in Iran eventually managed to win the leadership of the Iranian revolution. This is the first revolution in history which was led by the counter-revolution, which was 
actually suppressed it. In order to suppress it, it actually led it. Uh, Khomeini was the most radical anti-Shah the last six months before the insurrection. When sections of the left, even the Tudor party, even the CP, was calling for some sort of compromise, Khomeini was saying, no, Shah must go. I would not negotiate with the Shah. He was the most radical anti-Shah of the various bourgeois, you know, politicians of the time. So uh, he had a mass base. The urban poor followed him because the working class could not lead the urban poor. The urban poor went towards, you know, religious leadership because they are mostly migrants from the countryside. They are the most sort of probably section of Iranian society which could be influenced by, you know, religious uh, leadership. Uh, all these ideas of vague justice and you know, anti-West, you know, all these Islamic jargons are quite appealing to them, given their background, social background. Uh, but uh, they represented the poorest sections of the Iranian society, the urban poor, before the Iranian revolution. And it definitely had a huge fight, and it was with their force that it actually managed to win over the leadership of the revolution, uh, Khomeini, by mobilizing them. Uh, the whole of the uh, mobilization corps, pastor on army, the various, you know, vigilante groups that they have organized, all recruited from this layer. Uh, so that in itself, I don't think, you know, justifies uh, or gives any progressive nature. Uh, and if you look into the I mean, Lebanon is a very complex situation. I don't want to oversimplify it. Uh, but even now, in Lebanon itself, Hezbollah is attacking the left. Even before they have taken power, they are already attacking secular forces and attacking the left in Lebanon. Uh, at least Khomeini, before the revolution, didn't attack the left. He said, oh, communists are free, everybody is free. You know, he made all these promises. But this guy is already attacking the left. Because they know, you know, they have some backing, some. Uh, so I would be a bit sort of careful about the level. But, uh, I'm not saying you weren't. I'm saying, you know, one must be a bit careful about the level in this situation. Uh, I think it's true in Britain and it's true in Ireland that this movement would like to collab collaborate with other anti-war movements. But it is true that there's a criticism of the anti-war movement in the very existence of hobby because uh, what we're saying is what we're trying to build is a socialist uh, movement that links directly, that points itself directly to the working class. Now, the, the, the larger anti-war movement decided not to do that. It decided uh, just to draw on, on popular anti-war sentiment and that that would, would be enough, and it wasn't enough. And now, that, you know, there's been this sort of growth of uh, linking up with any, our enemy's enemy as our friend, uh, sort of philosophy. And... Uh, that's more important in Britain, where even though the war movement's uh, anti-war movement is quite much smaller, it's still quite a sizable force. Uh, here, it's very small indeed. And uh, but you know, neither picture is very optimistic. You know, because you've either got to persuade a movement that has turned away from directly approaching the working class uh, and trying to persuade it the other way, or else you're starting from a very small base. Uh, to try and do that yourself. Now those are all very daunting tasks, but the, the, we justify it by saying uh, that the payoff could be enormous. The pay and the, the difficulty of doing it is not the weakness of the Iranian working class, and it's the weakness of the Irish and the British working classes that makes it so difficult. But if we could, if we could make those direct connections, then we'd have an anti-war movement completely different from anything we've seen so far. Uh, and if you want to participate in that. Uh, we're going to have a slightly less glamorous business meeting, and uh, whoever comes along will have a speak about which direction we go in. Um, so I'm going to open what I'm going to call a final round. If there's sort of a master fold against this as a final round, that's okay with me. But I'm going to call it the final round and see how many people are down to to speak. First of all, it's not a foolish regime. You've seen the way it has maneuvered, you know, USA in the last 
couple of years or so, you, know, you say the way it has maneuvered, you say in Iraq, in Afghanistan. You know, it's not a, a stupid regime. Uh, in terms of anti-war, it's, a, it's playing a very clever role. Inside Iran, if you say there is a threat of war, they say you are a traitor. They actually arrest you if you say there is a threat of war. Because the regime wants to say there is no threat of war. USA would never dare attack us and we are, you know, winning the war. So there is no threat of war. Whoever says there is a threat of war is a USA agent. But abroad, they have mobilized. And who have they mobilized? The reformist wing of the government, which has been pushed into exile now. Uh, people who supported Khatami, the president prior to Ahmadinejad. Uh, a lot of them have been now pushed out of government, and it, some of them even forced into exile. No, the Ir- Iranian secret service is using these guys, who, who himself has actually sent into exile, to organize an anti-war movement. So he wants an anti-war movement abroad, but inside Iran, he doesn't want to s- agree that there is a threat of war. Because that brings into question their own policies, which is, you know, uh, f- fanning the flames of this war, basically, as the reformists are accusing the government. So you have the situation in which a lot of people have suddenly become active abroad. For example, these guys who run Kazmi. Have you ever heard of any of them before? You know, you go and research your last 20, 30 years of political journals. You not, do not even, uh, you know, uh, see their names once. Yeah. They have been here. I mean, for example, this guy <coughs> who runs Kazmi has been, I know him from my student days. He's been here in England for 40 years. Yeah. Now, why didn't he make a big, you know, political statement in the last 40 years? Suddenly, all these people, as if, you know, uh, somebody has sort of, you know, uh, told them to become active, you know, all these puppets have suddenly become active, anti-war. And their line is very simple. Yes, we know there are criticism against the Iranian regime, we agree, yes, Iranian regime is not as good as, you know, we would want it to be, but it's not as bad as, you know, you are trying to say it is. You know, look at Saudi Arabia, is Saudi Arabia any better? Look at, you know, uh, this and that, is that any better, you know, it, it is democratic, it has, this has a parliament, you know, this sort of very, you know, and what is happening in the anti-war movement, not only in Britain, everywhere, in France, in Sweden, in Germany, in USA, is not dominated by Iranian regime lobbies. These are lobbies run by the Iranian Secret Service. We know them. We know even the individuals who are doing it. But the left has fallen for it. The left in Europe has fallen for this. So what do you do? You either have to confront them directly, and, you know, which is what we try to do. We said, look, you know, the Iranian regime, uh, you know, we have to... Defending, uh, that's why we call ourselves hands of people of Iran. There's are two hands on the people of Iran, Khobeidis and uh, you know, USA. So it is uh, really difficult unless the left uh, here itself organizes a fight against the left itself, against sections of the left who are, you know, with this crazy, you know, Whoever, you know, even if Genghis Khan was alive today, I'm sure he would be anti-imperialist. It doesn't mean we have to defend him, would it? Because he would want to turn the whole of Asia into, you know, pastors for its heads, you know. So do we defend him because he's anti-imperialist? You know, it is just so crazy, the line that the left has taken in Europe and North America. Uh, even respectable figures within the left, you know, not only the CPS, you know, whole spectrum of, you know, Trotskys, Stalinists, Maoists, uh, the same is in the Iranian left. It's amazing. After 30 years of suppression in the hands of this regime, as soon as it made a little maneuver, you know, over this anti-war thing, 
All the Maoist groups have now suddenly become nationalists. All the three Iranian Maoist groups are now, you know, oh, no, you know, we cannot, you know, criticize. Yeah, regime is bad, but, you know, this is now the war threat. You know, we have to mobilize everybody. So they're basically calling for it. United Front is the Iranian government against imperialism. I think that has to be confronted politically. Otherwise, there is no way we, you know, we could get anywhere. Uh, so I think it's vital. Of course, you want to organize a campaign as a campaign, but us as individuals who are uh, call ourselves socialists or Marxists should really vehemently, you know, oppose this politics of the left. In when are we going to draw the lessons? I mean, I myself came to Britain in 86. If you remember at the time, the U.S. Uh, Navy was in the Gulf. Uh, Iran-Iraq war had finished. Uh, USA, in order to tell Iranian regime not don't have any plans, uh, just because you've won the war against Iraq, you think you, know, you cannot do other things, they brought in the Navy to the Gulf. Uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted. I came here, all of the left was, you know, banners up, you know, defend Iran against the U.S. Empire. Do you know who you are talking about? And I remember we had a debate with, you know, SWP, British SWP, who claimed, you know, you, uh, Alex Kalinikos wrote a book at the time, a pamphlet on the Iranian Revolution, in which he basically makes a claim, I mean, this is guys who know absolutely not that this is, the Iranian revolution was a petit bourgeois anti-imperialist movement. This is ba the basic characterization of the Iranian revolution. A petit bourgeois anti-imperialist movement. This is the merchants of the, you know, ruling Shia uh, clerics, the biggest landlords in Iran, is characterized as a petit bourgeois movement. As if any bourgeois movement is going to bring the capitalists out on the street. No, it's going to bring the petty bourgeoisie on the street to support it, obviously. Uh, the mass base of a bourgeois movement uh, does not mean this character is petty bourgeois. Anyway, uh, just to give you one final little you know, joke, uh, a few days ago, by accident, I was watching Press TV. Press TV is a TV set up by the Iranian government, financed by the Iranian government, to play the same role of Al Jazeera. Uh, they want their own version of Al Jazeera uh, TV station. This is based in London, headquarters are in London. Huge resources have been put into this. And they have a lot of difficulty recruiting journalists who are prepared to work with it because of the nature of the operation. And who is helping them to do this? CP and SWP. If you go and watch Press TV, you see all SWP comrades, you know, all CP comrades appearing on, you know, left, right, and center on, you know. Uh, the most ridiculous thing, I have a comrade, I have a friend in Iran who translated a book by uh, John Malinio on Lenin's part, published by Pluto Press. He's in jail for translating that book. They had... Pluto Press on Press TV talking about, you know, public, Pluto Press. So this is, on the same conference in which they expelled us from anti-war coalition, Press TV cameraman were filming the proceedings, you know, invited by SWP and CP. No, it's, I mean, we've done our best, but it's your job, you know, to fight these you know, politics, isn't it, really? Before we break up, could you just say something about the role of John Galloway in this? Because, because, just because he's... You're going to knock him out of the interview then, eh? Just because, no, let me take a minute. Just because he's the main figure that people that come across as spokesperson for what sort of politics that you're criticizing, George Galloway has a radio show... He apparently has a, a spot on this new TV as well. You just finish off on it. Say a few words about him. I think it is important. That's who the person you're mostly coming from. Well, you know, he's, I, I think he's, you know, you know him better than me. So, unfortunately, two years down the line, I bet you forget all his Islamic friends, you know, uh, as he picked them up so quickly, you know. 
And he needed, you know, the Bangladeshi was, you know, to get himself back into parliament. And you remember his ties in the time of Saddam anyway. So the least said about him, the better. <laughs> Especially now that their deal with Saddam has collapsed. 